It's Matthew Riley. Welcome to Booktopia. John, it's great to be back. Now, you've been a, a very busy boy. Um, this, is, this is Matthew Riley Overdrive. You've got um, a tournament that came out last year, and you had Troll Mountain release through ebook through the year, and now at Christmas, you've got the Great Zoo of China. Busy time. This is why I feel very tired right now. <laughs> it has been overdrive, and a year ago I knew the next 12 months was going to be Helter Skelter. It was. It was Tournament, Troll Mountain, and Great Zoo. I had them all lined up on my desk at home, and, and now they've all been released. It's fantastic. I don't want to give away any spoilers. There will not be any spoilers in this interview. Um, <laughs> but your book, it says on the front that it's in China, so I can say... <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about China, and there is a little tail coming down That's right. um, uh, on, on the cover. Um, why China, and what did you have to do research-wise to, to get it all together? You may not want to give spoilers away, but I'll do it, because I'm the <laughs> author. Uh, in the Great Zoo of China, the Chinese have managed to construct the, the greatest, the largest zoo ever built, and they've got dragons in it, hence the tail. Uh, you really can't, once you've got the tail on the cover, it's a bit of a spoiler. Um, Honestly, what I was setting out to do, uh, I had the idea for a zoo with dragons in it back in 2003. Uh, I, can, I can date it to 2003. It's when I stumbled on a dragon museum in Switzerland. But I couldn't figure out who would build the zoo. And then over the course of the early 2000s, China hosted the Olympics. Uh, I read all about China being able to build a new city in a month. Suddenly, I had someone who could actually conceivably, in the present day, build this colossal valley the size of Manhattan Island and put dragons in it. So I see it as a way for people to learn about China and have a great roller coaster ride as the dragons get up to a lot of mischief. So this, this is um, Action Matt is back. This is true, full action Matthew Riley at his best. Yeah. The tournament was a bit of a departure. The tournament was a, a mystery thriller. Um, but I, yeah, I like to think Action Matt never really went anywhere, <laughs> and I think the Great Zoo of China really shows that um, I, I can, when you when you go for action, I go for really big action. You've always been a very visual writer. Mm -hmm. When when I'm when I'm reading your books, I see everything, and I expect it to come out on DVD just after I've read. It. Mm -hmm. What is happening with that side of, of of things, the movie side of things? I, I was just in Hollywood three weeks ago. Uh, the biggest problem is the money. Uh, you know, when you write a, a book of this size, uh, that you know you've got you've got dragons throwing very large objects around. Uh, it, it's a, it's a Michael Bay Transformers style budget. You're looking at 150 million dollars, and right now, Hollywood is really only spending that money on comic book adaptations and Transformers movies. So, I can only wait and hope someone in Hollywood decides to you know roll the dice a hundred million dollar bet on a Matthew Riley book, but I've sort of written myself out of the market. But it, it seems to me like the most obvious thing. It's like they, they are sure things. They're already, like the director will just have to sit back and uh, you've already given all the directions in, in the writing. I mean, mm -hmm. how easy would it be to film Ice Station? All the shots are already chosen. <laughs> like it's, it's laid out in front of them. I've always tried to be visual. Uh, and I've always said, I think the audience thinks visually. The audience thinks in terms of a movie language, long shots, close-ups, and I, I write in that manner, you know, unashamedly. Uh, it, it seems like it might be easy, but Hollywood, like, like everything, after 2008, Hollywood really sort of tightened the budgets and tightened the belts, and so now they're really going with comic books. How important is it then, um, as, a, as a novelist, as, a, as a, an entertainer, as, as mm -hmm. primary um, reason for, for writing, is it to get the facts right in these, in these moments? Can you bend the truth to fit your fiction? I, I think if you're going to, say in the case of China in this book, uh, if you're going to make statements about the country, I think you should, you should be correct. You, you should be able to back up what you say about China. And I mentioned, say, Googling Tiananmen Square inside of China. You will get tourist information yeah. about the square. That, that is true. So I think it's very important if you're going to make statements like that, you are able to, to back them up. Um, beyond that, once you get into the fantastical elements of the book, say the dragons, what I think the world demands now is that wonderful word, verisimilitude. That if you're going to create dragons now, they can't be cartoonish. You have to 
ground them in a reality. Where did they come from? Why do dragon myths exist? How can something the size of an airliner fly? And so you work on the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, making the dragon lightweight, working on its skeleton, what are its bones made of? Um, I look at the recent Batman movies, the Christopher Nolan mm -hmm. movies and the Dark Knight trilogy. He grounded a story of a man who dresses up as a bat in military realism. The Batmobile, his cape, his, his helmet, uh, all the high tech stuff, he made it real. So yeah, you've got to ground your facts on, say, China in reality, and even your dragons, they have to be grounded in a reality. It's more dangerous with the dragons because there's so much mythology and there's so many people who love these, these creatures mm -hmm. and there are experts out there. But with, with fiction, um, everyone can come up with their own proofs <laughs> because it's, it's just fiction. So you're going to have some, some very um, uh, avid uh, dragon files if they <laughs> have no idea what the fans of dragons are called. I, I, um, I still remember reading Terry Pratchett's Guards Guards where somebody summons a dragon to Ankh-Morpork. Pork. And the images in that book of this dragon flying over the streets, spraying fire, incinerating and melting the, the cobblestones, it was a wonderful image. For my dragons, I looked at animals like great white sharks, saltwater crocodiles, snakes, hawks, real creatures, uh, looking at their abilities and giving them uh, to my dragons to, to ground them in a reality. I want to ask a question uh, just, just about um where you sit in, 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 in this realm of fiction in mm. this world. Because there, I remember watching, a, uh, there was an episode of a, um, Tuesday Book Club with, with you, Lee Child, and Di Morris, mm. and, and Bryce mm. Courtney. Yep. There was a discussion about popular fiction and the way that it was mm. perceived. In Australia in the last probably five or six years, I've been watching Australian writers take over the bookshops. There's mm. been more and more Australian writers in the front of bookshops um, and getting some 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 right some some big press, um, and getting getting some some room. And I think it's because of writers like like you really forging um, those markets um, yeah. um, to, to 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 get it. Um, but there is still that 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 side of Australian book selling and side of Australian um, book talk. You know, the reviewers and that divide the world into literature and popular fiction. Mm. And um, there's far more discussion about a book that sells 300 copies than say a book that sells 100,000 copies. Um, does that matter to you anymore? Are you over all that? <laughs> no, next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, you know, it's, it's something I've encountered from the very, very beginning when, when iStation came out in what, 1998. Uh, what I ultimately discovered is that there is a literary versus popular battle in every creative art, in painting, in movies, in music, in books. Uh, there is always going to be this discussion between uh, the literary and the popular, and um, I just ignore it now. It's white noise. Uh, all I can do is write the best book I can write. Uh, I find myself reading book reviews in newspapers less and less. Uh, I still remember one of the, the major newspaper in Sydney didn't review Ice Station, but they reviewed a book called Garden Plants of China. Maybe they were onto China early, but yep. I was thinking, how many people in, in Sydney are going to be looking to read Garden Plants of China? Um, ultimately, you can sit at home and stew about this. Uh, I like reading everything. I read popular, I read literary, I read lots of non-fiction. So if I go to get a review, I just want to see if they think the book will appeal to readers of that kind of book. So mm. if you're going to review Peter Carey's new book, will readers of that kind of book enjoy it? Uh, if you're going to review a new Matthew Riley book, will readers of that kind of book enjoy it? But once upon a time was my book Scarecrow. Uh, one newspaper gave Scarecrow to the theatre reviewer to review. And predictably, he didn't like it. Um, why do that? Yeah, I, I don't understand. There's been a that. few of those recently, and they're just idiotic. They're just it's it's no point in saying no. this popular novel is not Tolstoy. We everyone knows that, it's, and then ripping it apart because it's not Tolstoy. It's just idiotic. That, um, that reviewer was always not going to like the book, mm. and was not going to do the service to readers of that kind of book, which I think is what the book review pages are for. After this 
busy spurt of creativity, what is next? Is there going to be a tournament too? Is there going to be... What, what, what's happening next in, in the world of uh, Matthew Riley's imagination? Well, as you said, it's been a big year with tournament, Troll Mountain, and, and now this. So, first, I need a rest. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm looking, actually, to, to perhaps relocate to, to the United States for a while, um, throw my hat into the ring in Hollywood. Uh, but in actual fact, I, I told my assistant to block off all of 2015. I have... No speeches, no tours, no nothing. Uh, I just get to sit down and think up the next idea. As you've said, now that I've got tournament and great zoo as well, there are a lot of fans of, of the young Elizabeth and Roger Ascombe, so there could be a sequel to the tournament. I did some research in Malta uh, concerning that recently. CJ Cameron, you know, the lead in Great Zoo of China, uh, if she survives, no guarantees, um, you know, could come back for more as well. So. I need a good rest, and it's always fun to come out, unleash your work on the world, and then you go and recharge and come up with something new. I, I always try to top. Each book has to top the one before it. Topping this one is going to be hard, because this one is as bad, about as big as I've done, so I'm not quite sure how I top it. We look forward to reading anything you write from now on. We're, just, we're, we're eager. And you've given us so much this year, but we're, we're really hungry for more. So take your, take your time, uh, but uh, get us something as soon as you can. Thank you very much for joining us at Booktopia. Thanks, John. All of Matthew's books are available from booktopia.com.au right now.